Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lukes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. In this video lesson, we're looking again at chapter three, material and energy balances. We've been looking at the energy balance and this is the most general energy balance uh, or first law of thermodynamics equation that we have. And we discussed where all these terms come from in our first video for this chapter. But basically we have the accumulation piece here is equal to what flows in minus what flows out plus the work and heat transfer that occur across the boundaries. Now the one thing that we want to remind you of is that U plus PV may be combined to H for flow. To simplify this somewhat. We also had an integrated form where we integrated from time two to time one. Remember that delta is time two minus time one. And here we see the flow streams in here. Now we want to look at the case of a closed system. And if you have a closed system, so for a closed system, there is no flow in or out. So these two chunks go away and I'm left with this is equal to this. Let's look next at an example using this. We want to evaluate the heat transfer needed to evaporate water in a piston cylinder assembly. Now a piston cylinder assembly, basically just think of it like a cup, right? But it's got a plunger that can move up and down in there and all the material is trapped, okay? So if you push on it, you apply additional pressure, you decrease the volume, and you know, vice versa, if you pull back on it, it's going to lower the pressure and increase the volume. Uh, this is, for instance, in your car, okay? So I wanna figure out the heat transfer for evaporating water in a piston cylinder assembly. The initial state is saturated liquid water and in this case, the volume and the internal energy are given. You could look this up using the data tables, but for simplicity, the information is provided. And the final state is saturated water vapor. And again, properties are given. So all of this is happening at one megapascals. So I am not changing the pressure, but I am going from the liquid state to the vapor state. This is a closed system, so I'm going to start by looking for the correct form of the first law or the energy balance. All right, we have the mass at the end time times the total energy at the end minus the mass at the initial time times the total energy at the initial time is equal to the shaft work plus the expansion and contraction work plus the heat transfer. Now we need to make some basic assumptions. Now we've already made one that it was a closed system, but we can also assume that they haven't said anything at all about kinetic energy or movement. And so therefore I will assume that it is equal to zero. And the same with potential energy. There needs to be a height difference. And although the piston is going to move a little, so I guess some of the material will move, it's not going to be very significant. In fact, once you get more skilled at this, you will be able to go in and, you know, with enough analysis, go and determine that these things truly are inconsequential. But the kinetic energy and potential energy being zero is certainly going to streamline things. So that's going to get rid of those terms there because they will be identical. Uh, because it is a closed system, M1 is equal to M2. 
And now then, what about all these heat transfers and works and all of this? Well, okay, shaft work, remember I described in terms of a pump. Shaft work is going to occur for systems with flow. In this case, I've said it was a closed system. There is no flow. There's, but a shaft is a rotating piece of equipment and a piston cylinder has no rotation to it. Therefore, the shaft work is going to be zero. What do we know about the work of expansion and contraction? This was actually defined in chapter one. Work of expansion and contraction is that negative PDV, okay? Which in our case here, if the pressure is constant, this can be integrated If pressure is not constant, I need to know the relationship. We'll talk more about that as we go through the course. And I can recast this in terms of mass times specific volume minus specific volume at state 1. Therefore, I can combine this to solve an expression for Q. When these are combined, Q is the mass times u2 minus u1 plus p2 times v2 minus p1 times v1. We don't know the mass. They have not said anything about the size of the system. So I will solve for q over m. And we have most of this information given to us. We will need to pay close attention to our units, however. When I substitute these in, I get the delta U's in kilojoules per kilogram, and I get the PV is megapascal times cubic meters per kilogram. Now I'm going to give a recommendation that when you have pressure, if you can in your head, always convert to kilopascals. No matter what pressure is given, use pressure in kilopascals. just going to make the unit conversions a little bit easier because with that my unit conversion is one kilojoule is one meter cubed times a kilopascal and we'll see this one so often that you know I will just in my head say ah kilopascal times cubic meters that's a kilojoule I don't need to write it down anymore when I complete this calculation, Q over M is equal to the first grouping gives me 821.97. The second grouping is 193.13. All of this is now in kilojoules per kilogram. My heat transfer per unit mass is 2015 kilojoules per kilogram. Now I did break this up and work this so that I did it separately. And what you see is by far the largest change is in the internal energy. A small amount of this is in the expansion work. Okay. Let's now do a second step. I'm going to take this cylinder that is currently full of a saturated steam and I'm going to continue heating it to 600 degrees C. All right, again, the volume and the internal energy are given, but you could have looked this up. Now, we are still doing this at one megapascal, so P is still constant. Therefore, I can use all the assumptions I had before, no change in kinetic energy or potential energy, no shaft work, and work is going to be the integral of PdV, and I have, therefore, the equation is just the delta U plus P times delta V. And when I plug these numbers in using the appropriate units, 1,000 kilopascals instead of a megapascal, I find that Q over M is 920 kilojoules per kilogram. Now again, I want you to pay attention 
to the answers that you're getting and pay attention to those numbers and the values and start making sense of things. Because at some point, you're going to have developed that engineer's intuition that's going to make your life so much easier. But right now, you're just starting, but you have to pay attention. And the thing I want you to notice here is that the heat transfer to just go from saturated liquid to saturated vapor, no temperature change happened. That process had 2,000 kilojoules per kilogram of heat transfer required. To continue heating it up from 180 degrees C up to 600 degrees C, that's a huge delta T, right? The heat transfer required for that was only 900 kilojoules per kilogram, less than half, right? So therefore, this heat of vaporization or the going from liquid to vapor, that is going to be a big energy hog. And that's going to be useful. We're going to look, find out that there are ways that we can take advantage of that to make things work better for us. And that that's going to be a problem to overcome in other situations. This concludes our lesson on closed systems. We'll be doing more with them as we go through the course. But we want to, in our next lesson, come and look at steady flow processes. Thank you very much for your time.